started all of a sudden. No one knew about when it started. That is going to be inherited and in a particular locus. So, this is the mutation in that area. Now, there is going to be a tremendous amount of shuffling recombination happening right on either side. But if you take it, an observation, that block in the blue area, that zone, complete zone, is present in all individuals, irrespective of how many meiosis have happened. At each time there is a meiosis, right? So one zygote means how many meiosis? Two meiotic meiosis. So if you have two chromosomes, it's a two meiotic meiosis. So each individual is counted as two meiosis. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight individuals. That means it has gone through almost like 16 meiotic events. Irrespective of 16 meiotic events here, that block within a region, and this mutation within this block is traveling fine, but this whole region itself has not changed over 18 generations, 16 generations. It can continue forever. That means in a human evolution, Whatever these polymorphisms and mutations that occurred long, long, long time ago have been traveling all through the, with all these shuffling processes, but that areas, there are obviously small blocks and chunks of DNA are going to be constant all through these individuals. That means we can trace back to the lineage even to the original human beings when they arose. You still will have those blocks will be constant. They are not going to be shuffled, because shuffling can happen. What is the least amount of recombination that can happen in distance of DNA? Can you guess? What is the least length of recombination? Half a centimeter? Half a centimeter? No, it is just a single base pair. Between two base pairs, the recombination can happen. All right? So, the theoretically, there should be three billion possible recombinations possible. Okay? But all of them are not going to be shuffled in the same way. Therefore, there's going to be some blocks which are going to be kept unique all through human evolution. And those blocks are called, this mutation is located within an area that is present in linkage disequilibrium. Because that is the one which is taking it to be a 0% to 10% difference. That's what is that, that whole block. Rest of the blocks, are going to be shuffled by recombination. So there are areas where recombination is going to be less. Okay, those are called linkage disequilibrium. Yes? Is it possible that it changes after this? What? Well, it has not changed over generations or thousands of generations. I doubt that it's going to happen next generation. No, it will not happen. Yeah, I'm like, what is protecting from that change? Then? Those are recombination hotspots, which are, which are obviously susceptible for recombination. But the areas which are not, nothing is going to happen, okay? So they're always there. So that principle was identified about this, 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 all these concepts only happened in 2001 or something like that, okay? Or maybe 1999. So this is, what is it called? This basis of, this, this kind of an observation of the human genome was sequenced, this kind of observation of a small, small blocks existing in a linkage disequilibrium concept came only very recently. Much before that, linkage we know. We know that the, if there is a disease gene is associated with a mutation, I mean, associated with a polymorphism, there's a linkage. Linkage is well known, but the blocks and chunks of DNA all through the genome have got certain uh, uh, so-called linkage disequilibrium. That concept is very recent, okay? And that concept has been exploited by what is it called? I think, the, I don't know why in the book, has been told this way, but let me, uh, let me talk about the linkage disequilibrium blocks a little bit later, but now let us talk about measuring linkage disequilibrium. How to measure this kind of a linkage disequilibrium in the human genome. Okay? That is also called a D prime. That measure is considered to be 0 to 1. You could call it 0 to 100%. I don't care which way you call it but that is zero to one. One means it's 100%. So 0.94 means 94%, okay? So, <clears throat> so now you can take the number of generations we're talking about, okay? If you take
take this number of generations here, obviously those which are all these all recombinant fractions here, recombination. So if you look at this plot, the only thing that is present in a complete disequilibrium is going to be almost like one in ten thousand recombinant frequencies. That means they are really tightly linked, that is link linked in disequilibrium. So even though it is a thousand generations, you still have that particular one constantly being carried out. That's exactly what we talked about in the physics principle. So if you have theta equal to half, that means it's a 50-50. We talked about recombinant versus non-recombinant to be equal. That means that is complete equilibrium. That means there is no, you know, there is obviously more recombination going here. There is going to be less recombination going here. Okay? So using this principle of linkage disequilibrium, they have come up with what is it called a half map. In three billion base pairs, they took example representatives, for example, from Japanese, from Chinese population, from a population in Utah, which they think it is representation for European families. They don't know how it is, but that is what the consensus originally started. So they took that about like that, about five or six populations they have really taken and sequenced of their genomes. And they found millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms among these individuals. Okay, millions. So if you take a look at the African, this is only this, this is a little bit the older slide, and therefore you're not going to get the proper representation. But if you take a look at American, Europeans, and East Africa, East Asians, etc., among these polymorphisms we are talking about, like a million polymorphisms almost like, quite remarkably, almost 95% of them are going to be common for all the population. It doesn't matter whether it's Chinese population, etc. But interestingly, in fact, we are the only organisms in the world, you know, who have the, the differences among the two individuals are going to be very less. But if you go to Drosophila and other organisms, the differences are dramatically more. So fortunately for us, the differences are very limited. Among all these million nucleotides, 94 are common, okay, 94 percent are common, whereas only a few polymorphisms are distinctly different from African population versus East Asian versus European populations. And these polymorphisms are extremely useful polymorphisms for mapping studies, not those which are common. Okay. Those which are uncommon polymorphisms are going to be extremely useful for linkage studies. Let us take a look at this linkage disequilibrium here. This is the chromosome. These are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So you have got polymorphism 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to 14. So this polymorphism, in the sense, at, at that position number one, in a one population you will have a G, in another population you may have an A, in another one you have an A, G, G. These are all the different polymorph, you know, uh, population that they have studied already. So now, if you take these nucleotides and put them together, like you know, this is G, in a second uh, a locus that is a T, and so on. So, the occurrence of these, this is one haplotype. <coughs> so, if you take that, 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 and that, that is one haplotype. But if you take another one, A, C, T, T, G, T, T, etc., this is another haplotype. Like that, they have computed five haplotypes. But actual combinations, possible combinations of these haplotypes, how many? Because there are 14 nucleotides. There are, let us say this is nine, this is the first, first block here. There are totally 14, right? 14 polymorphisms are there. So what is the total number of combinations that you can put these into haplotypes? It is 2 times 10 to the, 2 times 2 to the power 14. That's a large number. Whereas if you take this one, there are only 4 of them they have taken. 11, 12, 13, and 14. So that is 2 to the power of 4. Whereas
that there are nine of them here, therefore that will be 2 to the power of 9. So 2 to the power of 4 is how much? 16 possibilities. Okay. But look at this. Out of 16 possibilities, there are only three haplotypes here. One haplotype is called CGTA, another haplotype is TGTA, CTCT. The rest of the haplotypes are not there at all in the population. That is almost 99% of the haplotypes existing in human population are only these three. Although theoretically, you can have 16 different possible haplotypes. All right? So what does that mean? That means it is not distributed equally. It is not having 1 16th, 1 16th, 1 16th, 1 16th in the population. There is what is it called a linkage disequilibrium. Okay? So if you take a pairwise, like if you take a, that combination of a C and the combination of this C, that means two C's in a given population, that would account for 60%, let us say. Whereas the T, for example, that may account for 30% or 20% or whatever. So that differences in percentages will determine whether this particular block is in this linkage disequilibrium or not. So what they have done is elegantly, all because of the six or seven different populations and the whole slew of information is available, they took pairwise haplotype, like pairwise, like you know, taken the base number one and base number nine, and that they calculated these so-called linkage disequilibrium. That is, if, for example, if it is a 94% here, that is essentially in linkage disequilibrium. Anything greater than 0.8 is considered to be in linkage disequilibrium. Like that, they have taken all, entire genome, and if you do this kind of a block, this was done actually at the Broad Institute in MIT, and they got these kind of a blocks, which are called linkage disequilibrium blocks, that is LD1, LD2, LD2, etc., like the entire genome they have mapped. So that means these blocks are going to be in linkage disequilibrium, whereas there are areas where such things don't happen. Those are the combination hotspots. Okay. So you can go to the human genome now, and these linkage disequilibria are already known. That means all these SNPs are already known. So if you have a person suffering from some particular disease, so you take his DNA and look at his mutation, whatever that mutation, and then look for association with these LDs. Let us say there are 1,000 LDs, linkage disequilibria low side. So you could go back and take a look at association of a genotype, I mean your, your, your mutation or a disease, to these linkage disequilibrium. Okay? That is not that trivial. Because you are talking about one individual with a single mutation, and you want to use this to find which LD is going to be associated with that. So therefore, instead of doing this, that is possible for single gene disorders. Maybe cystic fibrosis, it may be possible. Maybe some disease like a hemophilia, it may be possible. You can do it. Okay. But if it were to be a complex disorder like diabetes mellitus or age degener uh, macular degeneration or some other uh, complex disorders like hypertension and things of that kind, how does this half map, how does it help you? It helps you because you can go back to twins or genetic monozygotic twins or whatever and collect their DNA samples. Once you get the DNA samples, you could amplify segments of those by PCR. The entire genome PCR can be done, amplified. Now there are microarrays available for the entire steps. There are million steps, right? All those million SNPs have been placed on a microarray. So once you amplify this DNA, you can put them on that, 
and identify how many slips are present in that particular individual and which slips are really being associated with that. So it is a complex map. Okay? You will get a lot of spots like dots, dots, dots like that. And some of them will depart and you can see on the top of the line there may be a few genes, a few LDs, which will be linked to the disease. That is the whole. But has it been successful? Yes. That's, that's called, in the last section, I think it's called genome-wide association studies we've talked about. It's called GVAS studies. There are almost like, so far, if I remember correctly, 750 loci LDs have been already mapped for these disorders. That means it only started only five, six years ago. And to date, 14,000 loci, and 1,400 loci, and almost like 750 important linkage disease will be associated with these multiple complex disorders have been noted already. Okay. But a lot more to be done. But did it really lead us to anything? Not yet. It will take some more years. By the time they find out what these associations of LDs, to which genes they are associated, and then only the disorders can be properly understood. At this point, it is only a casual association study. That is why it's called genome-wide association study. Okay. They are not the true linkage studies. These are association studies. There's a difference between linkage versus association. Okay. Can you sign up for just 